first time in town, I was walking down Hayden Street. Yeah, I'm Andy Blanchard. I work for Commercial Progression, and I'm host of Speaking of Design. I took it over two years ago, and sorry, this is the first one we've had. So <laughs> hopefully we'll have yeah, hopefully we'll have more. But uh, I think this is a good kickoff for uh, Speaking of Design, and you know, if there's any questions afterwards or anything else, please feel free to communicate uh, on the meetup. And I, you know, would love if anybody else wanted to present or if there's anybody that knows of somebody that wants to present, um, we're totally open for having that. Uh, Shane and I would like to do this probably once a quarter, um, if more, if we can. So we actually met Matt uh, at Detroit New Tech. Um, he gave this talk and we thought it was a great opportunity for us and he uh, needed a place to, or wanted a place to, to present it again and I thought this was great for us. So I will turn it over to him and we can uh, afterwards question and answer and mm -hmm. kind of go over anything else that you guys want to talk about. Thanks Andy. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, Andy said, my name is Matt Fletcher. I'm, I'm with Atomic Object. Um, before I get into the talk, uh, I, I would like to give like a, a little brief outline of, of what what the composition of the talk is. So, uh, frankly speaking, I really only have about twenty-ish minutes worth of material to present. But I've got uh, I would like to open it up then to some open conversation because I've got and I've got a few questions to lead into that because I found that that open conversation part of the of this is is actually the much more more interesting part. And I th I'm I'm. I'm sure from given history of giving this talk that you all are going to have interesting things to, to ask about. So uh, that's the, the outline. That probably about 15, 20 minutes. So yeah, 40 minutes-ish, we'll be out of here. Yeah, uh, I'm Matt. I'm with Atomic Object. We, have, uh, we do work on uh, custom software products. We have three offices across the state, Ann Arbor and Detroit, and Grand Rapids. I'm from the Grand Rapids office. so. Um, I, I love visiting Ann Arbor. This is a great place, and thank you all for having me. At the same time, don't ask me too many detailed questions about what, you know, how to get out of here or anything like that. Um, okay, thanks for coming. Let me give you a, a little uh, history on this topic. So um, about a year ago, well, let's back up. Here we go. This, uh, this journal, DMI, Design Management Institute. This is a, uh, an organization that's a nationwide organization. It's mostly grounded in industrial designers. And um, they're publishing all kinds of great stuff. And honestly, I think the software community just doesn't really know very much about DMI at all. I, I only really ran across it because a, a friend of mine pointed it out. But I never hear anyone else in software talking about it. It's kind of a shame because DMI is doing some cool uh, design research and, and publications. Check them out. A um, little bit about DMI itself. It's it's a real thing. It's like, you know, 27,000 members across 40 countries, uh, and you know they they like to they like to pitch to management level. So they've got numbers about how many CEOs, presidents, partners, etc. They're mostly uh, corporate designers. So, for instance, um, you know what they mean by corporate designers are folks working in something like a steel case or a Herman Miller. Industrial designers working inside of a big organization. But they have, you know, as you can see, a, a fair number of them are consultants as well. Uh, the uh, this thing I've been holding is the uh, the journal, and. They publish this journal about once a year, and it's got it'll have about five to six uh, formal like academic research papers published in it. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this, but here are their papers. Okay, so the problem is they're really interesting, and I like it because it reminds me of some. Some of the good old days of being a grad student, pouring over really tough academic research papers. But the problem is that they're, frankly, fairly dry and kind of boring. And 
I read through them because it's fun and I learn cool stuff, but I don't expect they get a lot of readers because, sadly, you know, sad to say, because um, it's just, I don't know, I don't, it's hard to get into. There's a, there's a steep learning curve in getting into this, which is too bad because I read this article, What is Good Design? An Investigation of the Complexity and Structure of Design, and it's fantastic. It's got some great information in it, some great results, and it's a, it's a bummer that it's probably not getting picked up by as many people, especially those of us in software, because it's great stuff. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. The authors start out the conversation by talking about uh, why, why does good design matter? And that kind of sounds like a, you know, a well-duh thing, because it's like, oh, of course good design is important. But you know, they, they try to think critically about it and say, like, well, why is it important? And so the authors talk about, um, they have an interesting perspective on it. This is my interpretation of it. Um, and you know, they, they note that you know, firms are having a harder and harder time differentiating between each other on a number of factors. Uh, for instance, like with, you know, due to the globalization, you know, it's, firms are, you know, in terms of getting things out on time, price, quality, locality, like, Competing on these axes here is, is difficult because there's really not a lot of wiggle room for differentiation between firms. But one thing that has really started to come through is, is, is design. Now, you know, good design, to talk about good design, I mean, that's a big, I, I kind of picture that there as like a big amorphous blob. Like, how do you, cap, how do you totally capture good design? That's, that's a, you know, that's not a black and white question. But the authors argue, that you know, if we can capture, if we can get some understanding of what it means to have good design, then that could give us a huge competitive advantage. Okay, so we're certainly not going to describe all of good design here, but if we can capture some of it, you know, we can learn a lot. So, the uh, the author said, you know what, you know, we talk about good design all the time, and and we we value it, but like, what is what the hell is it actually? So like let's let's take a crack at it. Let's let's use some uh, research um, approaches here to to try to put some numbers on these things and identify these characteristics of good design. So here's what they did in their study. Um, at one of the DMI conferences several years ago, they had about 109 industrial designers who participated in their survey. These designers have both both corporate and consultant backgrounds. So some were internal at like a steel case or whatever and others are consultants. They got them, uh, they, gave, they gave out the survey and what I kind of picture is getting like a half sheet of paper or, some, or maybe like a full sheet of paper with a question up top and you know you write your answer in below. The question was, quote, please tell us your definition and criteria for good design. Please be as specific as possible in listing aspects and elements of good design in your view, end quote. It's an open-ended question, and uh, you know, I kind of I, I don't know exactly how it played out because I didn't see it. But I kind of picture people would go in and they would they'd fill in the bottom half like a, a few sentences describing you know what is good design to them. So how did it break down? Well, um, the authors went through all of the responses and they identified things that they called thought units. Now this is an approach I'd never heard before, but I, I some friends that are involved in the social sciences, so this is a fairly typical approach that you can take in the social sciences where you don't have like firm black and white, you know, mathematical numbers you can put on things. Thought units, they would read through the sentences and they would say like, well, this person's talk, clearly talking about one particular thing here and another particular thing in these, pair, in these sentences and another thing in these couple sentences here. And they identified across all those 109 people, 418 um, thought units. So, for instance, I might have had four, you might have had six, someone else might have had ten, you know, whatever. So that's their pool of data to work from, 418 thought units. From there, they went ahead and they started doing more um, hierarchical categorization. So they identified across those thought units 24 different themes. And then from there, they further categorize them into, into seven higher level categories. Um, interesting note on the, the themes is that they found that 
you know, again, if they want to categorize it, they had roughly 14 that were customer experience related and 10 that were business related. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by these themes and these categories. And these are, these are definitely not all of them, but it's a few examples. So for instance, we have a category called customer perspective. And in there, we have things like customer awareness and empathy, quality, makes life better, uh, emotions and feelings, emotional bond, desirable, positive impact, business performance, you know, business profits and results, appropriate for market and culture, good design process. These are some examples of the categories and themes. Again, we've got um, in total 24 themes in seven categories. So here's, here's some examples. One thing that the authors noted and I thought was pretty interesting is that um, here, see how we've got this 14 customer experience and 10 business related? That's like roughly half and half of the aspects of good design that are important to the end consumer and things that are important to the business. And I think that's a really important uh, distinction to make because um, I, f I feel like I hear a lot of you know, talk in the design community about doing the best thing for the user. And that's important, don't get me wrong, if we're going to default to some, something, we should default to that. But at the same time, the business has needs too. Okay? And you can see some of those examples in here. For instance, um, on the customer side of things, we've got the customer perspective and emotional feelings aspect, you know, categories and aspects of design. But on the business side, you know, we have to make sure that um, you know, we've got good consistency across our product lines and our brand, and that um, you know, we file, follow a good process that's sustainable for our business to pursue. And last but not least, of course, we need to like get profits and make money, you know, creating and selling this product. Otherwise, we're, we're, this business is gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make it for very long, right? So I think that's a really cool uh, note that they that they make about the importance between consumers and business. I'm gonna flash this slide up here. Um, I recommend don't try to read this because we're not gonna try to read this. What I, the only thing I want to show here is that here are the 24 themes and that um, here's the distributions of how many thought units apply to those different, different themes. And again, don't try to read it because we'll, I've got more coming. But the point here is you can see the shape of this curve is that it's fairly spread out. Okay. Now I know that you all were trying to read that and everybody tries to read that and everybody wants to read it because it's got good stuff. It's impossible to read on that slide because it's just it's an academic research paper. It's a lot of data crammed into one, one little graph. So to s spare you the pain of trying to read that graph, uh, instead you can feel the pain of trying to read this one, this table here. Um, I did my best at presenting this better with bigger fonts because I know that everybody wants to see what those themes are. Okay. So on the right, I've got all 24 themes listed. And I've also grouped them by how many percentages of the thought units you know, we're on that theme. And a um, few different things to point out here. You know, it's a, f for the most part, it's a fairly even spread. Like, there's a lot of different components to good design, 24 different components. Nothing really dominates. If anything dominates, um, it's the aesthetic and the functional. Okay, and the authors identify what they call three different tiers. Okay, so on the top tier, at things coming, um, coming over 10% of the, the, the thought units are, are functional and aesthetic. You have a second tier in that 7 to 9 range, okay, where you have customer experience, emotional bond, innovative, and creative. Okay? And then you have everything else at that 1 to 4% range. So it's fairly spread out. Aesthetic and functional might, they might dominate at some level, but at the same time, that's only 24%. So even if you have a, a product that really captures aesthetic and functional, you've still only captured a quarter of what good design is. Here's what the authors had to say about it. Quote, the complexity of good design is suggested by the variety 
and diversity of themes that were identified, ranging from aesthetics to sustainability to emotional bond to business results." End quote. Another good quote from them. Uh, quote, the potential conflict among some of the themes is further evidence of good design's complexity, end quote. Um, and we have some examples of that here. For instance, um, you know, form, function, relationship, and, and po you know, positive impact and ease of, if, there's, if you start, you know, appropriate environmentally, you know, there's some things that could easily be conflicting with each other. Um, again, don't try to read this too carefully. The, the, the data here is showing how do the thought units break up across the consultant and the corporate designers. One of the bars is the, the corporate designers, and the other, the other bar is the, is the consultant designers. And um, the general takeaway from this is, you know, for the most part, the corporate and consultant designers were in alignment. 19 of 24 themes were within 2% of each other. But, there's always a but, corporate designers prefer customer experience, ease of use, quality. The consultant designers prefer business profits and results and reflex period. Um, what the authors have to say about this is, quote, the corporate respondents generally have the higher percentage for the customer-related themes, whereas the consultants have the higher percentage for the business profits uh, results. Where they differ, each group appears to place a higher emphasis on its direct customer, end quote. So for instance, corporate designers, their end customer is the, is the end consumer. So they care a lot about that customer experience, ease of use, quality. Consultant designers, their, their direct person that they're selling to are the corporations that they're consulting with. So they care a lot about business profits and results. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't all care about everything, but there are some preferences here. Okay. So that's the data, that's the results. Implications in future research. One thing that the authors do is they try to come up with a, what they call a structure of good design. So they, they went through and they found another way of you know, breaking up their categories and, or sorry, the themes and categorizing them. And what they come down to are the customer versus the company related themes. And from there, um, going further into aesthetics, functional, uh, brand, et cetera. I think the idea here is like this is kind of like a, an outline or a rubric or something that you could use. Like I kind of picture, I like to picture this thing like printed out and hanging up behind a project team that's working on a project and, and being able to back reference this and say like what is, you know, what are those aspects of good design and, and, and how can we, you know, make sure we're, you know, we're fitting into this, this structure nicely. Um, other things that they consider are, uh, understanding how people process good design. So, you know, we, and, and brand emotion linkage, we know that when people are, say, you know, walking the aisles or, or browsing a website at, for different products and how they, that those first interactions, we know that people, you know, react to things emotionally in those, those first interactions. And, and, and here's some hints that we, that we can use um, to help us understand why people might react more positively to this or negatively to this or positively to this brand over here and negatively to that one over here. You know, we know people react that way, but like here's some, here's some places, to, some data points to start from to help dig further into why that, why that is. Um, and then, you know, design assessment and aligning team objectives. You know, say that we've got a number of people working on a project and there's disagreement, uh, you know, about you know, what's, what's the better design here? Which approach should we go with? Well, now we have something like this that we can point back and say like, oh, it looks like our, at a high level, we want, we want to prefer these things over these things here. All right, so uh, having a quote, having a shared understanding or definition of good design can be essential to the success of a design team and helpful in resolving conflicts between interdisciplinary design team members. 
end quote. There's some limitations, of course, like any good study. The authors, they went through, and it was, it was three people that went through and sorted and categorized those thought units. Um, you know, they're concerned that, you know, other people would, would probably categorize those things differently, especially people who are coming from different types of design backgrounds. Okay. And, you know, also the, uh, the authors want to give credit where credit is due. Okay. They, they have not necessarily uncovered anything that craftsmen internalized hundreds of years ago. Okay, so that actually takes me to the main body of the article. At a high level, we did some research with some industrial designers. We learned that across, um, you know, asking them, you know, what is your opinion of good design? We learned that there are 24 different themes, of which a few are a little bit, you know, come up a little bit higher than others, but for the most part, 24 themes all are, you know, important. Uh, consultants and um, corporate designers are fairly well in alignment there too. So, you know, hey, big surprise, good design is hard to quantify. <laughs> but we took a crack at it and, and, that, and that's what we have. So I want to start out, um, you know, I'm going to take this to open conversation now and, and get some, some comments and insights from people. I'm going to start the discussion with a couple of questions. Um, the one is like this. I don't know why it is, but even when we go, and, and maybe you all can help me answer this question, but why is it that we can all talk about the, the importance of good design and we can, we can read through an article like this and we can be like, hey, you know, of course, you know, function and aesthetics, they're both really important. Um, we've got these other themes too, but why is it that like, we, it seems like in our day-to-day -day conversations and, and, and what we're talking about when it comes to good design is we end up like putting function and aesthetics against each other. They always end up against each other. Do we want this thing to have a, a, a stronger look and feel that has that stronger emotional appeal to us as humans? Or do we want more features? And they always come down to like colliding with each other. We know from the article that both are important. And if I told you that, like hey, I read this article the other day, and it said that both function and aesthetics are important to design. You'd be like, well, duh. So why is it when we're having those conversations you know, in our, in our uh, project teams, working on software projects, and we're always, we're always pitting like aesthetics versus function and whatnot? Like, how, how do we end up putting the two against each other? What, does anybody have a comment on that, Andy? Uh, so we're a development shop for, for web, and our biggest thing is I look at that line as, as a budget or a rubber band, and it kind of stretches out. That budget gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner, and whoever gets to pull more one mm. way or the other usually wins until that snaps in that budget. You go over or you're, yep. you're perfect, and that's, that's where it's at. And I think it really, for us at least, it goes down to time and budget um, versus you know poor design and buff. Yeah, comment, I know Brian, I, I saw you had your hand. Yeah, I mean, my comment was pretty similar to that. It's, it try, kind of just changes the scope of what you're actually trying to do. I mean, good design is something you strive for, but the limitations of reality come into play. Like, what was Andy's name? Yeah, Andy said that, I mean, you always, you have to get the function down first before you can even get to the aesthetic. So, um, you obviously want to make all the parts, if you're doing a website, for instance, you want to get all the, the core functionality in there done, and then you can address the aesthetics to it too. So, I think a lot of it comes down to budget, at least in my my experiences. Well, do you think the findings from this article would argue that you should be pursuing both at the same time and not necessarily have one follow the other? Comment? Any comments on that? Uh, go ahead. Um, you Sam. Know, maybe it's not like a, a single continuum. Maybe there's a it's a two by two, right? So you have function here and aesthetics here. Mm -hmm. And low aesthetics, high function, the example we sometimes use is a water heater or something. And then a high function or high aesthetics, low function, maybe a, a Renoir. And then <laughs> low aesthetics, low function would just be a piece of dirt on the sidewalk. And high aesthetics, high function <laughs> would be um, an iPod or mm -hmm. something that's really beautiful. And I think there is sometimes a, a stretch. I don't work in an environment where there's a, a financial balance we have to make, but there is always time balances. 
And I think often the, the, the particular kind of function, the particular kind of aesthetics that diner, designers really love are very simple aesthetics yep. and very beautiful functions, you know, simple functions that sort of suit your aesthetic mind that play off each other. And it's, I think that's maybe a upper quadrant that I usually aim for. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's <coughs> kind of interesting that maybe we juxtapose those two things and present them as at odds, but in the marketplace, the successful products right. tend to marry the two sure. really well. Or at least in that, in cert, depending on what quadrant of, you know, what Sam was mm. describing, you know, I've, a lot of people probably don't care much about what the water here in the basement looks like, ah, but, right. yeah. you know, but that's, that's an interesting, that quadrant's a nice way of thinking about it. I, um, I have some, my own examples, uh, one is, um, I'm not, I'm, I w I'm not going to pull it up here, but uh, one place where aesthetics was emphasized and function failed was, wait, am I getting my, I feel like I'm getting my examples confused. I had this, uh, there was this uh, company that wanted to start selling this, this water filter pitcher. And uh, instead of like, you know, the Brita pitcher that you can get the kind of boxy looking thing that, um, you know, I think that this competitor would argue like you wouldn't want to like take that water pitcher out of your fridge and put it down on the dinner table for like your, your guests to come over, right? Because it's a big clunky thing and you, it's kind of ugly looking and you pour it and like the filter thing falls out and it's kind of embarrassing. So you wouldn't want to have that for your dinner party. So what if you had, a, what if you could, you, sh you should buy our water pitcher. Okay, our water pitcher, so it had a really nice, like, kind of hourglass type shape to it, and it had a, um, a, a aesthetically very nice thing. It was the kind of thing you would want it to put on your dinner table, okay? You could easily pull the filter part out, so you could have it filter water off to the side, then when it was ready to go, you could take that part out, put it off to the side, and then put this nice, you know, well-formed glass in the middle of your, your dinner party. Um, well... The reality, and I, I, I was like, okay, I'll try, I'll give it a shot. Like, I'll, I'll get one. Let's, let's, let's do it, right? Get it. Used it for the first day. I was like, okay, this is okay. And then, like, I started having all kinds of functional problems with it, right? Like the, at the top, like where the there's a flap, okay, where the water's supposed to. Can, can you imagine like a Brita pitcher where you have like a flap? The 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 Brita pitcher, you would like squeeze your thumb, and the thing kind of like swings open and then like pinches your thumb and you're like, oh, okay, and then you start pouring water in. So their solution to that was like, well, what if the pressure from the water coming out of the faucet could like push the flap open? Water goes in and then as soon as the, the faucet turns out, the flap closes and, you know, very nice. It was cool, except when it didn't work. And I turn the faucet on and the flap doesn't open because it didn't get hit hard enough or at the right angle. And now there's water like spraying all over my, you know, all over my shirt and like all over the counter. Right, or when I go to to pour it, and it's just really slow to pour, and I'm like waiting forever for the water to come out. So like, you know, that was um that was an interesting example of like a, a, a of a product that took the strong aesthetics, and they tried to they they tried to get the function, but they didn't quite get it, and it was they came up sh just short enough that I was like a disappointed customer and ended up asking for a refund and everything. So like, that's kind of a bummer. Um, but you know, I, I give them crops like or props. They they tried. They they took a crack at it, and I hope that their next. I gave them feedback, and I hope the next rev they nail it because it's a cool, cool thing. It was a good example to me of why like why you'd want both. Um, so another question I have for the group: um, are, are these results something you feel like you could use and apply, or are they still too abstract at this point? So if I if I had handouts, and I handed out something that had maybe this on one sheet of the one side of the paper and then like maybe on the other side like this data like is this something that you feel like you could take and use directly or is it like, like I said is it too abstract at this point because that's something I've been kind of concerned about personally that it's still a little too abstract what, what do you all think I think it's kind of abstract because it's like how do you measure like what aesthetic is like quantifying that like each of these different things so you mean like if uh, you want to sit down with the team and evaluate the aesthetics of this particular prototype or possible design or whatever, it's... Because it's, like, aesthetics is kind of subjective, too. 
You're not gonna be like, oh, hey, who thinks this is pretty? Like, everyone raise your hand, you know, so. Yeah, and I think in our last talk, or your last talk, yeah. we talked about this as far as, for me, I can see a use case, um, whether it's an internal client or an external client, on a project, setting down with them and having them actually fill this out mm. as far as reflecting to the project, like what's important to them, and then they fill out the percentages, what's important. You mean and like this, have them actually address this question? Actually, the, the chart that you had of yep. aesthetics, function, this one? Um, ease yep. of use, and we see a lot of times that clients will go through a whole project and they'll have one thing, they'll told us one thing in the very beginning, and they get to the very end and they're like, actually, you wanted it to function better. And it's like, well, you said you wanted it to look really nice and spend half your budget on that or three quarters of your budget on the, on the design, and not on the function. So it's just as, as a good case to measure against the beginning and the end of what was important to the end client. Yeah. Do you find that, is that, in your experience, is that often the same person or is it different people from the same organization that have conflicting views on? Uh, usually, usually it's the same person. Same person. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as they get through the project, I mean, we're continually showing them what's going on and keeping them in the loop, but um, whether it's somebody else is telling them through the process, hey, we need to add this in there, or that didn't get achieved correctly. Um, it, you know, it just kind of morphs into something different. And this, even if it is just a good check to go back and say, you know, this is what you wanted, are we moving in a different direction? If so, yeah. that may change the scope of the project. Yeah, I wonder if, as well, you could, while you're in the course of developing the product, you could have weekly or monthly or whatever, some frequency check-ins with at the whole team and say like, are we still, are we hitting what our preferences were for these aspects of good design or are we drifting and is that okay? You know, yeah. Like have frequent check-ins on that. Um, yes? In the spirit of there are no dumb comments, would it be worth considering kind of collapsing so many attributes or themes into maybe a little bit more broader buckets so that you had fewer of them. I mean, I'm just imagining a discussion with other, with teammates or, or clients, if you're a consultant, some way to wrap your kind of head out around these. Yeah, so the, simpler way. Yes, yeah, so are you saying that like, uh, if you were to present this to clients or whatever, it might be, it's like, oh, 24, like, whoa, that's how yeah, am I supposed to? Yeah, I mean, just to look at the list, it's, yeah. it's a lot of things. It's a lot of things, yeah. Um, you know, the authors, I only got four, there's, there's seven total, I could look them up if you want, but they, they took a cut out, oh, yeah, I see. you know, coming up with some okay. categories. But then, you know, you get to this level, and then these are even more abstract, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's tough, it's a tough balance. Now, you had a hierarchy, too, that might be useful. Yeah, okay, let's question. bring up yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. something like this. Although just glancing at that, it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> I, it speaks to the complexity of this problem, right? Yeah, like, yeah what right. is good design? Yeah. And this is only what was captured in this one research study. What, what would have come out by you know studying other forms of design or right. whatever? It's a. That's why I called it at the beginning of the talk a big amorphous blob. You know, <laughs> what is good design? Yeah, it's funny when you read from the paper. I think sometimes some academics could stand to learn something about good sentence design. <laughs> like 70 or 80 words in a sentence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One thing I noticed about this hierarchy is that the first thing they divided up on is uh, customer and business yeah. themes. Yeah. Uh, that was curious. That's right. um, yeah. Especially considering the sort of the dichotomy you mentioned earlier between aesthetics and function. I mean, not that that's a good way to break things up, but, but that was the first thing I would have thought of. Especially since so often, um, for many of these like sub themes, it seems like the ones that support customers also support business. As designers, we sort of assume that, well, if I make something that's easy to use, people are going to rate it highly on Amazon, and they're going to recommend it to their yep. friends, or they'll buy it again, and that supports the business. It's yeah, you know. and that's not captured very well in this particular visualization. And they they talk about this in the article. Like coming up with this was hard because there's if they. <laughs> You could easily cut this thing where you, to your point, Sam, they could draw lines between that one up there and down here, and like, you know, it's all intertwined, and this was one particular way to cutting it. They probably could have cut it a different way, you know, 
over here. Yeah, I mean. From, from our perspective, and maybe you guys as well, uh, just even clients themselves, you know, if it's a marketing client, if, if they're on that side of the spectrum versus the engineering, the functional side of it, um, we kind of have to educate them with the project at hand and, and what really they're trying to, to achieve as far as business-wise, function-wise, design-wise, and you know, handhold through the whole process so they're not going down one path overly yep. versus going down another. Yeah, I don't have a problem with you know, providing features. I want to provide the right features, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, that's it. Well, thanks, y'all, for coming. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm working down Haven.